peace of Christ be with you, and welcome to our service again this week. We're glad that you're here. Um, we're also welcoming those who are joining us on Facebook Live and who will join us later with on the recording, uh, not just today, but throughout the week. We welcome you. Um, I want to say that how much I appreciate everyone is doing to stay connected to the church during these very difficult times. Um, we all long for the day when we can remove a lot of these restrictions and be able to be back together in full force. But in the meantime, um, this is a testament to the people of God that we always find a way to be together, even if it's virtually, whenever, uh, no matter what we're facing. <clears throat> we do have a Sunday school time each Sunday at 1145. If you're interested in that, there is a link in the newsletter, or you can see me and I can give you that link. It's on Zoom. Um, <clears throat> Today we're starting a study on Pastor Adam Hamilton's book, Unafraid. Uh, you don't have to read the book to participate, but if you'd like to be a part of that, he'll be looking at, we'll be looking at fear, and uh, which is, all of us are dealing with all the time, but especially during these times. And then after that, we'll start looking at specific things that he, that he identifies. Our order of service will be the same. Uh, we, and we're not giving printed bulletins because we try not to give anything that we've, that we've touched to people, um, and so that means that we're not allowed, not really, we're encouraged not to sing, and also, but I do invite you to participate in the prayer responses and in the Lord's Prayer. So again, we're glad that you're here. Welcome everyone, and Terry's now coming to begin the first part of our service. <coughs> Please join me in the call to worship and prayer. God scatters the seeds of reconciliation and love and waits. God scatters the seeds of healing and hope and waits. God scatters the seeds of redemption and peace and waits. May our hearts be the rich soil in which God's love takes root. Let us pray. God, you know us so well. We thank you for your presence in our lives, even when we don't recognize it. This day we have gathered, coming from a week of unexpected happenings and events which have surprised us. Make us ready to become stronger witnesses for your love as we receive your word and find our spirits and lives healed. Amen. to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst forth in song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Ooh, I lost my microphone. Okay, we're going to do the children's message. Um, and so... When I was reading the scripture that Pastor Rod um, read, seeds came to mind. And so I have always had the DNA for seeds. I grew up on a peanut farm. We planted peanuts, we nurtured them, we watered them, we hoed them, we just like took all care of them. And then at the end when the harvest came around, we harvested our crops and so we saw the bounty of our fruits of our labor. And so... Um, I've never wanted to be a farmer ever again, but I have dabbled in the little seed business. Thus, I brought my little plants here. Um, so these two plants, uh, one day I was making chuck some guacamole, and I took the avocado seed, and I put it in water, and this is my avocado plant. 
that I have. And then I also had some lemon seeds probably when we were doing some, um, maybe some shrimp boil or something. And I took the seeds and these are my lemon trees. And so I have these wonderful little trees or these little plant things that are growing that I'm just extremely proud of because they're mine. And so when I planted these like over a year ago, I never knew that God was going to take these little plants and create a message out of them. So here's what I have learned from my little plants. Um, I never knew that whatever I was doing over a year ago was going to actually be used for God's work. And I think we don't really realize that when we are planting seeds for God, that, you know, we don't know when we're actually going to see the fruits of our labor, and we may not ever see those fruits of our labor, but we plant those seeds just in case of and we hope that they're going to work. Um, I know that if I have any plant people here, Gail, <laughs> saying, oh my gosh, you call those plants. Well, to let you know that my poor little ugly plants here, they have survived all the wind and the rain for the last couple of days. They've survived in my living or in my kitchen. They've survived a move, and they're not very pretty, but you know what? They're near and dear to my heart. And so a lot of times we aren't the best speakers, we aren't the best singers, we aren't the best whatever, but we're near and dear to God's heart, and he's going to use us somehow, some way. And so we need to be like these seeds and grow, and no matter what we actually turn out, God can always use us. And then the last thing that kind of came to my mind was, I planted these little things, and my grandkids came over, and Tommy and John and Connor, I would show them my little trees and stuff, and we went to a restaurant where we had some lemons, and they saved their lemon seeds, and they said, we want to grow lemon trees like you, Tisset. And so with me growing lemon seeds, I passed on something that somebody else can actually grow as well. And so we can plant those seeds as Christians and we never know if our seeds are going to be like somebody else wants to grow like we planted our seeds. And so we just keep building that uh, network of sending out all of those uh, little seeds out that we don't, may not even know if they work or not, but somebody else may be encouraged to plant seeds as well. So if I had known that a year and a half ago my little trees would have been up here in front of y'all, I probably would have put them in prettier pots. I probably would have made sure they got better light and cleaned off and probably would have made sure they look a little bit prettier and probably weeded them a little bit. But it really doesn't matter exactly that we're perfect looking. God can always use us if we're just willing to plant the seeds. So if we can pray, please. Dear Lord, Thank you for the rain, soil, and sun that helps us grow, helps our seeds grow. Thank you for giving us spiritual seeds we plant in our schools, neighborhoods, church, and communities. Please use the seeds you give us for your glory. Amen.
Would you stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel lesson from the beginning of Matthew's gospel, chapter 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have as much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone who has ears listen. The word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. A great cheer went up when Jesus finally emerged from the little house where he had been teaching. The crowd had slowly gathered throughout the day. Any latecomers could forget about getting inside. In fact, by the afternoon, a person couldn't even get close enough to catch any of the sounds wafting through the window. And that was a shame, because there were obviously some juicy things happening in there. This impromptu event started that morning when some locals brought to Jesus a man who could neither see nor hear, a poor soul afflicted with a demon, and Jesus healed him just like that. So easily, in fact, that the religious authorities, authorities in attendance accused Jesus of being in cahoots with Satan, an inside job to impress the crowd, if you would. Well, you know that ignited an argument, with Jesus lecturing them how their loose use of language was causing real harm to real people. Then there was a commotion by the doorway. Jesus was coming outside and was heading toward the beach. When he sat down in a chair by the water, the excitement grew even more in anticipation that he would deliver a message that even more people could hear. So many people crowded around, in fact, that Jesus was whisked into the boat just offshore where he would speak without fear of being overwhelmed. All right, all right, pay attention, Jesus quieted the crowd. One day, a farmer went out to sow some seed. The people turned to each other, some with quizzical looks, others with delight. Jesus usually gave lectures or debated his opponents or allowed his acts of healing and miracles to do the talking. But telling stories? This was new. At first, they're not sure what to make of Jesus as a storyteller, but that fades quickly. They're absolutely absorbed, ready to see where this is going. One day, a farmer went out to sow some seed. He reached into his bag, grabbed a handful of kernels, and flung them into the air. Then he started walking, and as he did, he kept slinging the seed. His movements were so random, it appeared he wasn't even paying attention. As you can imagine, some seeds fell on the blacktop road outside the fence. Some landed in the loose gravel at the edge of the field. Some went into the weeds. And some, against the odds, even made it into the good rich soil. The neighbors watched what was happening with not a little concern. Some wondered if the farmer might be slipping a little bit, need to get checked out. Others watched to see if some of those seeds were drifting over into their carefully maintained fields. Some must have called the OSU Extension Office because before long, a young woman in an official-looking T-shirt got out of her truck and walked up to the farmer. How's it going? Great, just great. There's seeds everywhere. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. That's quite the technique you have there. Uh, by the way, I was wondering, if you ever want to know the latest farming methods, 
Just let me know. And by the way, when, when was the last time you had your soil tested? I can check that and let you know the best place to plant and what kind of seeds would be most efficient, if you like. Thanks, but I'm good, the farmer said, smiling. Almost finished. When Jesus started talking about the result of this so-called planting, none of the listeners were surprised, at first anyway. The seeds that fell on the pavement quickly became bird seed. Those in the gravel took root for a while, on, but the ground was so shallow and the heat of the sun and the heavy rain did them in. The ones that landed in the briar patch grew up just fine, but you couldn't tell them apart from the weeds, and they were soon forgotten. What about the seed that actually made it into the field? Somebody shouted from the back. Then he turned and whispered to his friend, a good harvest would be about the most he could hope for, right? But from the way this guy was behaving, he'd be lucky to get anything. When the harvest came, Jesus said, it was a bumper crop. Ten times more than anybody in those parts had ever seen before. Who doesn't love a twist at the end of a good story? And this is a really good one. Unexpected and utterly confusing. Anyone who has ears, Jesus said, listen up, this one's for you. The crowd that day certainly had heard Jesus tell that story, but they weren't sure that they got what he was trying to say, if they understood the point. And all these years later, we're not sure what he meant either. Parables are like that. Stories don't come with four distinct points projected onto a screen supported with charts and figures. They're not aimed only toward the head trying to convince the intellect to accept certain propositions. Stories draw us into their world, invite us to look around, to live there for a while, and to come out changed. The stories Jesus tells are particularly resistant to being pinned down. The writer of the Gospel of Mark even says that Jesus spoke in parables so the people wouldn't understand, like he was hiding something from the uninitiated. Matthew, however, says that he spoke in parables so people would understand, a way to open their imagination. In chapter 13, Matthew records a series of parables that Jesus tells about the kingdom of God. This is a big concept, nothing short of the rule and reign of God on this earth. Jesus had been preaching about its arrival since he first came on the scene. But it's as if he doesn't want to be too specific. The prophets and poets spoke of it as a vision of society where all are treated fairly, where those most honored are the ones who take the role of servants, and success is measured by the treatment of those most vulnerable. Jesus wants to keep that vision out there while inviting us to figure out what it means in day-to-day -day living. When we spend some time with this parable of the sower, some images of the kingdom of God begin to come into focus. The unusual behavior of the sower, for instance, seems to beg us to pay attention. He's relentless, spreading seed, apparently without regard for the result. Will Williman remembers that when his mother died, he found great comfort in the letters that he received from many of her former students. His mother taught school for 40 years. In many ways, Williman writes, public school teaching is one of the most frustrating of professions. As a child, I watched my mother filled with great dismay when her pedagogical efforts seemed to fall on deaf ears. The lesson plan that she devised in hours of preparation died in class. The struggling student with whom she spent hours attempting to assist in learning flunked the final exam anyway. In teaching, there is much frustration. And yet, he continued, here were these undeniable testimonials to the harvest of her hard work. 
I wonder if she knew how much of her time and effort had meant to these people. Did she know the fruits of her labors? And then he said, years ago, a man who had spent his whole life working with teachers in a continuing education center told me, the chief positive characteristic that a good teacher must have is this. Good teachers must be in love with the art of sowing the seed, but do not need to be there for the harvest. That's true, not just for school teachers. All of us invest ourselves in other people, in institutions, in causes, in ways that many of us will never see the results. Parents tried to do the right thing, raising their children, persisting through their tiredness and worry and sometimes just not knowing what to do, hoping that someday that the child will grow up and say, you know, I appreciate what you taught me. Many of you have given so much of your time and energy and financial resources to this church, all with the prayer that lives will be changed and people will find community. We tutor children learning to read, sponsor new folks at AA meetings, mentor young people starting their careers and marriages, all while envisioning in our hearts an anticipated harvest of blessings we may never get to celebrate. And there's something else strange about this sower. He is slinging seeds everywhere. Good ground, rocky ground, in the weeds. Other planters would consider this a violation of their best practices taught at the farming seminar in town last week. A consultant from the big seed company would be horrified. But the sower isn't picky. You would think that he would want to assess the soil determine where to plant to give the best chance to produce a big yield, minimize the waste of the investment. Julio Diaz is a social worker from the Bronx. Every night he ends his hour-long subway commute one stop early, just so he can eat at his favorite diner. One night he stepped off the train, was walking along the platform toward the stairs, when a teenage boy pulled the knife on him and demanding his money. Julio handed over his wallet, and as the guy was walking away, he called after him, hey, wait a minute, you forgot something. If you're gonna be robbing people for the rest of the night, you might as well take my coat as well to keep you warm. And now the thief is confused. Why are you doing this? And Julio said, well, I don't know, man, but if you're willing to risk your freedom for a few dollars, then I guess you must really need the money. I mean, all I wanted to do was go get dinner. And if you really want to join me, hey, you're more than welcome. You can follow me if you want to. So Julio starts walking toward the diner where he usually eats, and the young man joins him beside him. They sell into one of the booths, and soon the manager comes by. Hi, Julio. Then the dishwashers come by. Hi, Julio. And the waiters come by to say hi. And the kid says, man, you know everybody here. Do you own this place? And Julio says, no, I just eat here a lot. And the guy said, but you're even nice to the dishwashers. Well, haven't you been taught that we should be nice to everybody? Yeah, but I didn't think people actually behaved that way. So when they're about to finish their meal, Julio asks, what is it that you want out of life? And a look of sadness came over the young man's face. Julio said either he couldn't answer me or he didn't want to. The bill came and I looked over at him and I'm like, look, I guess you're going to have to pay this bill because you have my money and I can't pay this. But if you want to give me my wallet back, I'll gladly treat you. I didn't even think about it. He just handed it over. Julio took the wallet, opened it, paid for the meal, and he pulled out a $20 bill and extended it across the table. When the young man reached for it, Julio said, I want something in return, your knife. And the guy handed it over. By telling that story, I don't mean to imply that we should put ourselves in dangerous positions. 
Julio was savvy enough to read the situation and to assess the young man and to respond that way is just the kind of guy he is. But what I do want to emphasize is how Julio didn't automatically judge this young man by this one action. He didn't assume that this man's life was the equivalent of rocky soil and that scattering seed there would be a waste. Matthew says that Jesus went out of the house to teach and that Jesus began the parable by saying that a sower went out to sow. It's interesting that many rabbis use sowing as a metaphor for teaching. So I think Matthew is tipping us off that Jesus is the sower. He has come on a mission to take the blessings of heaven and to spread them far and wide. And in doing so, he declares that no one is unworthy, no one is undeserving of the life that God has to offer. That no situation and no person is hopeless that he will continue planting those seeds of love with reckless abandon, to which every one of us can only respond by saying, thanks be to God, it includes me too. Amen. And let us pray. God of planting and God of harvest, we give you thanks for all your gifts to us, for daily food, for health, for each breath we take, and for the gifts of your word, your power, and your love. Our hearts are truly overwhelmed when we consider how you have entrusted so much to us. May we be worthy of that trust. May we be a people who are unafraid to live as fully and as richly as you want us to live. God of abundant blessing, hear our prayer. Help us, O oh God, as followers of Jesus to multiply all that you have given us, 
to risk spreading your word and perhaps see it misunderstood, to gamble by loving those whom others think worthy only of hate, to take chances by doing good to those who have not done good to us. Help us be faith-filled and desire to increase your glory and your goodness in this world. Make us people who share in both word and deed that which you have given to us. God of abundant power, hear our prayer. God who plants seeds of hope and justice within our lives, we are so grateful for this community of faith and for all anywhere who hunger and thirst for your healing, reconciling word. You know all the things that are on our hearts today, and you bring us together in love and support. God of abundant peace, hear our prayer. We ask the blessing of your healing mercies for those who struggle with illness of every kind, those who feel lost and marginalized, for those who mourn and for those whom the darkness of sorrow enshrouds. We ask that the rain of your nourishing love would wash over all those who hurt and mourn and all those who celebrate and rejoice this day. God of abundant care, hear our prayer. Be with each one of us and all those whom we have named in our hearts before you. Help us to reach out in compassion and support, for we ask these things in the name of Jesus, the same one who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, we want to welcome you here today. We're glad that you are here. We want to say thank you to Gail Mann for bringing the flowers again today, as she has now for several weeks. And she said she will until they're not there anymore in her garden. So. We appreciate, we appreciate uh, them brightening our, our sanctuary and our worship. Um, I want to say thanks to all of you for the many gifts you give all the time throughout the week and for the gifts that you give financially to the church as well. If you uh, would like to, there's a box there but there's, as you leave, but there's also many ways that people are giving through online, through Venmo, and through the mail. Uh, last week, m many of you responded to our request for volunteers. We're still looking for some greeters, those who are going to be involved in the readiness to prepare the church on Fridays or Saturdays for Sunday. And for if anyone would like to work back in the technology booth, Chuck showed me today he has it all outlined to let you know what you need to do. So if you're willing to do that, we can help you do it. Um, <clears throat> this Tuesday night, we will have our monthly administrative council meeting. We have been doing these by Zoom during the time of COVID, and so we will do this one by Zoom as well, 7 o'clock. All members of the council, of course, are encouraged to attend, but anyone can attend that would like to, to know what's happening in the church and to help us plan our, our ministry. If you would like to have that Zoom link, if you, have, if you don't know, uh, know what it is, it's in the newsletter, but you can also... Uh, Email me at pastor at bridgeviewumc.org, and I will send it to you. Next Sunday, I plan to continue this mini-series of sermons I'm doing on the parables of Jesus as he tells us about the kingdom of heaven. In the next parable, Jesus is still talking about a sower, but this sower is very different than the one that we read about today. This one sowed good seed in his field. But when everybody was asleep, an enemy of his came in and sowed weeds among the wheat and then ran off. So when the seeds began to sprout, the workers noticed something was wrong. So they went to the owner and said, didn't you plant good seed in the field? Where did these weeds come from? So their last question will be my sermon title next Sunday. Where did these weeds come from? I encourage you, if you want to, to read the parable in Matthew 13, 24 to 30, uh, before next week, and see what you think Jesus is talking about. And we'll explore that together next Sunday. Our invitation to discipleship today, briefly, is to say, keep doing what you're doing. And that is to sow the seeds of the kingdom of heaven. 
to keep investing yourself in other people, to keep investing yourself in the future, to keep looking towards that which we may never see the results of, but that we know are building a better community, a better life, and continuing to inspire people with the faith of Jesus Christ. And now let us go in the peace and love of Jesus with the power of the Holy Spirit to share the love of God with you all. Amen.